unusual to start off an introduction with an apology, but uh, Tracy, this shirt is a complete accident. I am not a Florida fan. I know you went to the University of Georgia. Um, and everybody should probably know, I'm just planning on doing some really dirty yard work later. That's the joke. Everybody here knows I don't do yard work. I was going to say, no, nobody believes that. Nobody believes that. Nobody no, believes, that. believes that. But we're very, very happy to have Tracy Jinks here today as our speaker. See my, see my red and black in the background? <laughs> it was noticeable. It was noticeable. <laughs> but we're happy you're here. Um, just tell, I'll tell a little bit about, uh, about you to the club and then turn it over to you. Um, I don't know why that you're not referred to in your bio as Miss Downtown Jacksonville, because you have certainly dedicated your career to Downtown Jacksonville. Uh, you've been with Cushman Wakefield since 2013, and everybody should know that if you're looking for office space, um, that's what Tracy specializes in, the leasing and purchase of office properties. Uh, before that, uh, she doesn't change jobs very often. Uh, she was with uh, Cushman Wakefield for 10 years before that. And we owe her a huge thanks for being part of the uh, Jacks USA team that helped um, lure Fidelity to Jacksonville. So very, very happy to have you here. Uh, very interested in hearing what you have to say about property. And um, just so that you know, I am also a, uh, I'm an FSU guy, so we do have an enemy in common, but we'll talk about that later, Tracy. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, yes, thank you. And um, I really do appreciate you guys um, asking me to speak at your club. Um, I actually was president of my club two years ago. So I'm like one of the happiest people in my rotary now because I can just sit back and relax. And um, but um, it's, it's great to be. I actually wanted to attend some of your meetings when I was president, but I was just too busy and I didn't have time, but, um, but thank you so much. Um, as Jason mentioned, I do specialize in office properties. Um, I'm with Cushman and Wakefield and our company is a global real estate firm. We've got over 300 offices around the world um, in 60 different countries and we've got over 50,000 employees. So we're a really large company. Um, we have offices in Wuhan, China um and we were kind of at the forefront of when all the pandemic started happening on helping our clients with you know getting out of their space and then getting back into their space so our um our company was kind of one of the, the first companies really to come out with <clears throat> excuse me procedures on how to get businesses back to the office because we were helping our clients in wuhan china so i'm actually going to uh, share my screen with you um uh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Is there a way for someone to share their, allow me to share my screen by any chance? Yes, I will give you that. Just give me okay. one second. I'm okay. sorry. Thank you. No problem. Um, our, our firm put together, I mean, this, this was in actually in March when I'm going to show you a quick video um, about the six feet office um, because that's what they were helping with people in China on getting them back to the office and they came up with the six feet office and that's kind of where everybody came up with had to be six feet apart. So uh, let me see if I can share my screen now. Yes, it looks like it's going to work now. I can get my All right, why is it not come is the video not coming up. I'm not the most technology advanced person on the world, so. <laughs> there we go. All right, let's see. You guys see it? Yes. Okay. Okay.
Okay. So um, part of the reason why I like sharing that video is I just like the guy's accent. I like to hear him talk, but um, um, they, when they generated this video, we thought that it was probably going to be, you know, just a few months that we were going to be dealing with this. But of course, as we all know, it's been way longer than we had anticipated. Um, so I've got another presentation um, to show you that talks a little bit about some other things that our company is doing um, to try to help companies with this. So let's see if I can share this. So start from the beginning. Hey Tracy, just so yeah. you know, we didn't get any of the audio on that previous one. Oh, you didn't? No. So oh no. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um he had a really nice accent. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um but it, he was talking about just you know the six foot office project that our company um has you know been at the forefront of they got guys from Netherlands and they were, you know, as I don't know if, how, many, how familiar you guys are, but Netherlands has not been as hard hit as a lot of other countries. Um, and they've been back to work pretty much through the, throughout this whole thing um, and working six feet apart. And if you, if you would notice in the video, they weren't wearing masks or anything like that. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so can you see this now where it says, does the future, what is the future of the workplace look like? Okay. All right, good. All right, so um, this is kind of where we talk about the video that we just showed, we just saw, you, the, you saw, but you didn't hear. Um, our company came out with kind of the safe six, which are six things on getting companies back to the office. And I see a lot of you guys look like you're part of your are working at home, part are back in the office. Um, our office, we're, we're at 50% now. Um, but we have a lot of companies that are still not even going to be back to the office until they're saying beginning of January. Um, these are larger call center type operators that have, you know, a lot of people that were, you know, in workstations right on top of each other. So um, that has kind of been the, the trend of these larger offices not going back to work anytime soon. Um, seems like some of the smaller offices are, people are getting back to work. Um, but we came up with these six and these are like the, the readiness essentials that companies need. Um, first, you need to prepare your building with cleaning plans and inspections and HVAC and mechanical checks, and then preparing the workforce and deciding you know, who, who needs to come back and how and when and, and how to communicate with your employees. Um, and then coming up with control access and you know, different protocols for safety, and then creating a social distancing plan um, by decreasing the density and your office patterns in your space, and then reducing your touch points and increasing cleaning, and then communicating with confidence. Um, and there's a checklist that our company has on our website. And then they also have a hundred page program if companies you know, need additional help with, and it, and it gets into detail that a company could actually go on our website and print out this information and it can help them with putting together policies on getting their company back in their office. So it's pretty, pretty good information. That's so, I mean, a lot of you guys have company, your companies are handling that for you, but I just share that just in case anyone needs any of that information. Another thing our company did was um, put together a workplace survey and we surveyed 50,000 workers across 99 countries with 2.5 million data points. Um, and this, these were not just our employees, but they were companies that we work with all across the world um, to find out what they feel like the future of the workforce is going to be like. So um, there was some really good information that came out of this and they're continuously resurveying people to find out so that we can continue to help our clients with what their needs are going to be in the future. Um, some of the key takeaways that we found were um, that, you know, there's all this commentary about going back to work, but we've found that 75% of people are productive at home. And so there's probably going to be kind of a blend of people coming back and then people continuing to work from home. Um, and that team collaboration actually was better than what we thought it was going to be um, with services like Zoom and Skype and Teams that people are able to collaborate. And then um, the, the biggest was that human connection and social bonding definitely has suffered 
But the main thing is that 70% of the younger generations are the ones that are really having the challenges, which we would have all thought, you know, they're technologically advanced, so they wouldn't have had the problems, but they're the ones that have younger children, or they don't have a larger house with an extra space that they could be working out of. So 70% of the younger population are where the challenges are really laying. Um, some of the successes that they found from working from home were that um, the workplace experience has still been maintained and that, you know, people can work from home fairly, fairly good um, and team collaboration reached new heights and then um, the vast majority of employees feel trusted that they can actually carry out their, their work remotely. Um, some of the challenges were the human connection. Um, there, there was a weakened connection to your company culture. And this is why I think we feel that, you know, office space is going to remain because people are still going to need that company culture. Um, and that a lot of people don't feel have a mental or physical well being. 54% um, said they don't have a sense of well being. They're, you know, they, they, they like being able to be more casual, but wearing their t shirt every day, they just don't have a sense of well being, you know, like they do when they go into an office. So, um, one thing also with like who should return to the office and they found that you know the salespeople, business development people are the ones that really need the interaction as well as research and development um because they you know when you run into someone at the water cooler you, you it strikes up innovation and that's 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 tends to be suffering a little bit by working from home um, on the operations and support side of the business, there's been very little downside. Um, call center operators, they've found a way to be able to track the calls and they feel like that I, I actually have a company that I'm working with. It's a large user in Jacksonville that's getting ready to put about 84,000 square feet on the market um, for sublease because they've decided that they're going to let everybody continue to work from home um, for a long period of time. So um, we're going to start seeing, I think, and there, a good bit of sublease space coming on the market or people whose leases are expiring, they're renewing in much smaller spaces and for shorter terms. Um, it's, you know, it seems like on a daily basis, I get someone I'm working with and they say, you know, we just want to renew for one year until we figure out what's going on with this market and how much space we really need. Um, and then when they do return, their space is going to be different. And they are going to probably have larger, you know, for a while, the workstations got to be um, smaller and lower walls. And now people are going back to the higher cube walls again and more offices. And that was kind of a trend that was already starting to happen. But then with the pandemic, it made people realize even more so that, you know, we need we need more separation for people. Um, and then re with people returning back to the office, you know, the home life commute was also a consideration if they had kids that needed to stay home with, um, those people probably should should stay home as well. It, make, it makes it easier for them to stay home. So um, future considerations that working remotely is here to stay. 73% um, of the companies um, think that they should embrace the flexible, flexible policies. Um, productivity can occur anywhere, not just in an office. And that um, the workplace is it's, it's going to definitely change. It's not going to be just a single location. It's going to be an ecosystem of a variety of locations um, for, for companies. So we feel that uh, the short term impact of the pandemic has been that social distancing plans means the companies will use more space, um, requiring you know less you know less occupancy but more space between people. Um, and then determining who should return to the office first, you've got to consider your demographics of your employee base. Long term, the people will have a variety of locations to work from. They'll be working from the office and their home, um, but office space is not going anywhere. We're still going to have an office because it just have a new purpose. Um, and then engagement will, you know, and the need to meet people will, it's still, it's still going to be there. We're still going to need that. Um, and that flexibility is key. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, I'll open it up now to if, if anyone has any questions. Hey, Tracy, this is Lisa Marie. Thank you so much for that presentation. I have a question for you, especially with regards to the remote uh, workforce, uh, which I'm a strong proponent of. But um, companies in the past have had tax issues related to remote workforces, right? 
Uh, they are located in Jacksonville, Florida, but they have employees that work in different states and the tax implications sometimes are so uh, negative for the employer to have that remote workforce. Do you see or anticipate changes in our tax laws because of that? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not a tax person. <laughs> okay. Stay away from taxes. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just curious. But, but that, that's a very good point. Um, you know, that, that is very interesting. But I bet, you know, we're going to have to see some changes if that's the case, because mm -hmm. the people are going to be, you know, for the most part, have been forced to be working remotely. Yeah. You know? Good question. Tracy. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Trace. Hey, Tracy. Yeah. Hey, Barry. Uh, Ran across something the other day that I thought was interesting. It, it had to do with REI building mm -hmm. a, a big new building, I think, in Seattle. Yep. And they been did. working on it for several years and yep. apparently got right down to the end and ready to go and suddenly said, uh oh. And so now what? They're they're trying to sell the building and they're gonna have gone right. back to having more locations. Yeah, and they're they're not even gonna occupy this space that they worked on. Um so really, really nice space if anybody wants it, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, and, I, and I've got a client that I'm working with that just signed a long-term lease and now they're saying, you know what, we've decided we want everybody to work from home, so we want to sublease it. So you're, you, we're, we're going to, and I, I think that it's, a, a, it's ultimately going to affect rates um, because when you get all this flood of sublease space, they're willing to offer up much cheaper than a direct lease. So landlords are going to have to get more aggressive on their rates. We've been, you know, in Jacksonville, the last few years, rates have, you know, been going up at least three to 4% each year on the office side, um, which is, it, it, it's bad for tenants, but it's good for investment. We got to a point where um, we were able to get new construction in Jacksonville because the existing product had about the same lease rates as new construction. If you start getting lower, you know, much lower rates again, then you won't see any new construction anymore um, because there's just such a disparity between new construction and, and the direct product. So that's an interesting thing to Thank think you. about too. Tracy, uh, um, and th thank you again. That's the, oh, that was interesting. As, as I enjoyed the, um, the, what was it, the clock, counterclockwise or clockwise movement through the, you know, spaces and everything. It was just something that, you know, I hadn't even thought about before. It makes sense. So mm -hmm. have you noticed any, uh, um, any trends in, in, uh, um, in the repurposing of space as people are subleasing them or trying to, um, you know, recapture some of their costs? Or are you seeing um, any, anything different like that happening yet? Um, we, ha we haven't yet, um, you know, right now people are just trying to sublease their space as is because, you know, there's a cost in making any modifications to them. Um, you know, I do think that, you know, some of the furniture systems vendors will probably be, try be trying to figure out things to put up, you know, glass partitions on top of other, you know, workstations that they may have so that you can get that separation. Um, you know, I do feel that we're going to have more hoteling because we're going to have companies that will have an employee work from home one day and then work in the office. So you'll have people sharing a desk um, to, so that they don't have to have a desk for every person if they're only there half the time. So there may be some changes in, in the way space is configured that way. You may be sharing a desk with somebody and then it's being sanitized between your days. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tracy, this is Mike Dara. Hey, uh, Mike. How are you? Good. I um, appreciate what you said. Just uh, about a week ago, there was an article, and there have been numerous articles about the decline of retail and the difficulties that the major big, uh, I don't want to call them big box, but the department stores and others have been having. And it's kind of in line with what Tom was talking about, about repurposing. Um, some of those stores I heard that Amazon is looking at using some as warehouses and other, I mean, things that just were completely outs outside what I would normally think. Are there any other possible trends like that that we're not even thinking about right now, but they might show up in the next year or two? There might be, there might be some, um, 
office buildings being converted into residential, you know, depending on, you know, how the building is, is set up. Um, you know, there may be possibility for doing that because we may end up with a lot of excess space and you're going to have to figure something out for that space because I don't know that we have, you know, the ability to be able to backfill a lot of it. And that, and especially downtown, um, I, you know, I'm really concerned as Jason mentioned, I am a huge proponent for downtown and it is concerning with, you know, the office towers and a lot of people don't want to be in buildings with a lot of people and having to share elevators. Um, you know, and then with, you know, not, not having people downtown, how that affects our downtown retail, um, magnificent as everyone saw is, is closing. Um, you know, and I, you know, I'm concerned about some other restaurants we have downtown. So that is another problem I feel with COVID is that it could potentially hurt downtowns. I mean, it is hurting downtowns, especially in New York, Chicago, those cities. I mean, they're not even, people are not coming back to work for a long time in those cities. It, so just to carry on question with that, as I've seen so many of these new apartment buildings being built, mm -hmm. are, are they being uh, taken up? Are people renting that space or looking like there's a tightness there? Yeah, on the, um, on retail or residential? Residential. Residential. Yeah, residential, I mean, is, is still on fire. Um, rates are not even going down. My husband's actually in residential real estate and there that market is still not not seeing any any issues um we probably will see all of a sudden a glut of some foreclosures coming up you know we're not seeing anything now because there's been a moratorium but i think after the beginning of the year all of a sudden we're going to see a lot of foreclosures so maybe then we'll start seeing a change in the residential market but the last recession was you know a problem because there were loans being given out to people that couldn't couldn't afford them but now that this is not that this this will not i don't think this will affect the residential market like the other recession did a great recession okay thank you mm -hmm. jason burnett has a question maybe not <laughs> the, switch. You know, the question was uh when president tom was talking about our live meeting so sorry, that was from yeah. a while ago. Um, that was that was a while ago, Patty. That was oh, he has his hand up. <laughs> a little graphic there on his picture. Uh, it's all good, Dean. Tracy, thank you for speaking with us today. Sure. Uh, as a fellow downtowner, tell us what are your two or three just pie in the sky wish list items for downtown. If you could wave your magic Tracy Jinx wand and make something happen in the next month, what would that oh, be? Oh gosh, that we would have more companies come downtown and take up all the excess space that we have downtown. That we could get mm -hmm. um, some an, an area of town where we would have a um, synergy with a lot of shops and restaurants. You know, maybe like St. John's Town Center, like smack dab in the middle of downtown with lots of energy and restaurants. Um, mm. We've got, we've got some great restaurants. They're just, they're spread, they're too spread out. We need an area where it's, I mean, my thought with the landing site was that we would have, you know, a park in the middle and then we would have some shops and restaurants kind of lining that area going down to the river um, and then have some residential um, behind those areas so that we had people that could help to, you know, shop and, and visit those restaurants. So, you know, although I really do, now that the landing is gone and there's the nice big grass area, it has changed my perspective. At first I was all about, we need to redevelop it. It looks, it looks really nice having green space down on the water for people to enjoy it. Um, so I think, you know, having some green space downtown is also a huge benefit for our, our city too. Mm -hmm. I overheard uh, two people talking on the sidewalk on Laura Street the other day. One was asking where the Starbucks was. And the other one was telling her that they didn't have a Starbucks downtown, which I, <laughs> I don't drink coffee, so it doesn't really matter to me, but uh, it's kind of weird that we don't have a Starbucks downtown. I know we did for a while, but we don't anymore. Yeah. But. And I think a lot of that changed because Starbucks' philosophy changed and they wanted everything to have a drive through. And mm -hmm. that's when they left our downtown because they couldn't get a drive through. Mm -hmm. so. Wow. I know. <laughs> uh, 
That's like who who would even use that, you know? Oh, and the other the other thing for downtown that I you know my wish list and that which is actually going to occur, and some people may not be for this, but getting rid of all these one way streets. Um, I know Lori Boyer is working on getting, you know, us have two way streets. I think that will help with the synergy for downtown and getting people to not be rushing through downtown. And, you know, we have, we, we have plenty of roadways to be able to, to have two way streets and then it's less confusing and doesn't scare people who come downtown and are afraid they're going to get on a one way street. Uh, I agree. I agree with that because I'm on West Adams. It's one way west, and people yeah. go 60 miles an hour down it. There's no, absolutely no reason to go I that know. fast in like a five block stretch. So yeah, it's crazy. So I agree with you on the two way streets. We're just trying to beat those lights, team. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> when they changed Laura Street from one way to two way a few years ago, I almost got killed a couple times, forgetting I had to look both ways. But um, <laughs> I managed. I adapted. There'll be a bit of a learning curve for the old timers, right? <laughs> Dinkins, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah just uh, I was just thinking that if those of us who think back, we can remember when there were uh, more two-way streets downtown and the reasons for changing those streets to one-way streets. So, and as far as coffee, uh, uh, I guess the 7-Elevens have taken the place of the Starbucks, I guess. <laughs> Um, Tracy, is there a part of the United States that that uh, Jacksonville tends to follow uh, as trends go in the commercial real estate business uh, that we should be looking at? Um, you know, we we tend to follow a lot um, Orlando and Tampa. You know, we're kind of you know with them being in the same state. Um, we you know I work very closely with my you know co-workers in those cities and they seem to be a little bit ahead of us. Um, Atlanta, we tend to follow a, a good bit, you know, behind Atlanta and Charlotte. Um, and we, you know, a lot of times we compete for business with those cities as well. Um, they're all, their lease rates are a little bit higher than us. So when it comes down to rates, usually we, you know, we beat them on rate, but, um, you know, as far as following, I mean, I would say probably those cities. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hi, Tracy. Hi. How are you? Hi. Good. Um, so I think it was last year before all of this started. Um, there was a big. There's a lot of talk of you know reaching that fifteen thousand residential number to really attract some of the businesses and some of the commercial, um, you know, boom into downtown. Are you, are we seeing um, a decline in the residential demand to to live downtown near downtown, or is that still kind of going up and 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 really doing well. Do you, do you have any kind of input on that? Yeah, so, you know, residential downtown is doing very well. Um, uh, Steve Atkins just, um, he just he just posted that the Barnett is completely 100% occupied now, yeah. um, you know, which took that's forever to, to get done, but it's 100%. Um, that's why Vestcor keeps building more and more properties because every time they build one, there's a waiting list for more. So, I mean, there's definitely a huge demand for more residential downtown. We just, um, you know, we just got to get the ball rolling. I know Greg, I see Greg on the call too. I know Greg has been really working hard on trying to get some stuff going downtown. So, um, you know, awesome. I think, I think, I think we'll continue to see more. I know Alex Safakis has bu been buying up more and more property and he's, he's trying to get more developments going on downtown. So I think, I, I don't see that stopping. I really okay. don't. That's good to hear. Mm -hmm. Tracy, are you seeing any of that um, residential development, um, especially Riverfront, pushing um, back into uh, um, the Brooklyn area off Riverside a bit? Yeah, I mean that area has been great. That's kind of that kind of started all the residential with you know 220 Riverside, and then it kind of filtered into downtown from there. Um, and with the new JTA, you know, center that's being done, all the resident, all the best core being done in that area, it's just moving closer into the core of downtown. And then if we can get the shipyards going, um, something going with the, the Ford on Bay and then the landing site, um, you know, we'll be even closer to that 10,000 mark. Great. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else have any have a question for Tracy? I see Barry's hand. 
Turn your sound on, Barry. <laughs> You're muted, Barry. <laughs> okay, my screen shifted. There you are. And, there you know, it's all of a sudden, it's like, oh, what do I do? Well, anyway. you're so far away. You're all the way in the Taj Mahal, so. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> it's uh, it's a little hot over here right now, but anyway. Uh, Tracy, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the landing. What's the latest thinking about the use of that property? They're going to be putting out RFPs um, for that that site. So there's really nothing definite on what's going to happen there. They're going to be putting out RFPs. That's what Lori Boyers told me. Okay. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tom, I had a question. Yes. Actually, actually a comment. We deal a good bit with the residential side, single family and some of the apartments. And I have been just shocked that very little, if any, uh, of the folks have asked for relief. A few have. Um, but these are sort of mid-level apartments, $800 to $1,200 a month. Uh, and the same with the single family homes and virtually none of them. Uh, have missed for the last five to six months. And this is probably 50 to 75 units. Um, and we deal also a good bit with some of the uh, bigger complexes that are dealing with uh, the commercial tenants. And the commercial tenants are having major problems almost at every level. Obviously, the movie theaters, the restaurants, and they're asking for enormous relief, and they should get it. Um, and the banks have been wonderful to work with. But on the residential side, I've just been really surprised because I thought that would be an issue. Obviously, the folks that own the foreclosures are way up. Uh, but on the residential evictions and the like, uh, well, not evictions because it doesn't go on, um, almost non-existent. It's been a real surprise. People are paying. I guess it's because of where they live and that's sort of first priority. Mm -hmm. That is a very good point because that's what I've heard too. Um, and that's kind of similar with the on the office market. Um, about 10% are not paying, um, whereas retail is down like 40% are paying. Um, so on the office side, so the, the office tenants are not using their space, but they're still able to operate. And so they're still paying their rents. So that's a, that's a good sign. Anybody, any, any other hands? I'm looking around. I don't see anything else. Thank you, Tracy, very much.